So this next session is about pitching. So how do you pitch a story to an outlet, to, to, uh, to an editor? Uh, and we've got an amazing panel here for you. Um, people from several different publications uh, who all focus on different types of science, uh, including you know, how science works, the process, the science policy. Uh, so I'm hoping this will be useful to you. Um, I'll give a short introduction on what pitching is and how it works. And uh, I'm coming to it from perspective of a news editor, so specifically news stories, also for online and print magazines. So I worked at SideEvNet, which is an online magazine, but then more recently for New Scientist, which is online and print. Um, okay, so what is pitching and why does it matter? Basically, if you're a freelance science journalist, or if you're a science reporter, you have to know how to pitch a story, you know how to sell your story to editors. And this, this is the true for reporters who work in-house as well. And why does it matter? Uh, it matters because most pitches um, are not that great. And most people who pitch, they don't really know exactly how to do it. Um, so this gives you um, an overview of why that's the case, uh, or how that's the case. And this comes from theopennotebook.com, and they have a really good resource on how not to pitch. Um, and they also have a database of how to pitch, which is really useful, and I, could, I would recommend everyone to read that. Uh, but basically, uh, writing a bad pitch is really easy, and loads of freelancers write bad pitches really quickly and send it to editors, and this really annoys us, as I'm sure the panel will agree. Uh, and basically, uh, we've had enough, and we're not going to take it anymore. <laughs> so this is why I'm here. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I want, to, I want to leave you on a positive note after this panel. And basically, we need you. It's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, editors need stories. You know, uh, for <coughs> a news outlet like New Scientist, each editor needs, you know, something like 10 stories a week. So we need ideas to come to us. Uh, so, uh, and we're willing to pay for them if they're good. Uh, the problem is, as I said, that most pitches are bad. And I would say sort of 10 to 20 percent of pitches and freelances are excellent, and you want to work with them all the time. About 10 to 20 percent of them are really, really bad, and you don't want to ever hear from them again. Mm -hmm. The majority are somewhere in, the, in between, and I think probably most of you will be in between. And what this session is about is how to get you into that top 10 percent. So you know, when you pitch to, to an editor, they actually say, ah, yes, I like their pitch. That's a good pitch. I'm going to take it. Um, so first of all, where do, where do pitches and ideas come from? Uh, for science discovery stories, basically they come from journal articles, from uh, conferences, from personal contacts and field trips, um, you know, from phoning up academics and asking, asking them questions and following up on stories that you've done before. Uh, and most, more and more these days they come from social media, from, you know, who you follow on Twitter. Um, so just, I think, this week there was a story about um, second hottest ever day on planet Earth that basically came from a tweet by a scientist in France who was with their me uh, meteorological office. Um, so yeah, all of these are kind of useful places for you to find stories. Uh, once you found a great story idea, you need to pitch it, right? So there's no point of having an amazing story if no one's going to publish it. And even though we've heard about algorithms today and about new media, I mean, Overall, still, it's the editors who make the decision. So it's the editors who say, yes, we will publish this story as a magazine or as a publication or not. Uh, so you need to know what editors need from you. And here, uh, there's a quote from another great uh, online guideline for pitching, which comes from SideEvNet. And we have an editor from SideEvNet here on the panel today. Uh, and they have practical guides on a variety of things, from how to write a press release, to how to be a science journalist, to how to pitch. And this is one from how to pitch. And I think, you know, if you take anything away from this session today, I think this would be it, you know. Uh, we want you to know what you're pitching about. We want you to be confident. Uh, you know, it has to be clear. It has to say what the story is. And you need to be friendly and flexible and work with the editor. It's, it's a relationship when you work on a story. So some people expect that you pitch, you file something, and then that's it. Actually, it's a process, and, you know, it's a back and forth. Um, so a bit more on what makes a good pitch. It has to be targeted, obviously, to that editor and to that media publication. You know, I often get, um, you know, pitches to new statesmen rather than to new scientists, and that's obviously <laughs> no good, right? So, you know, make sure that you know who you're pitching to. 
I will also get pitches for biomed story, all the stories, although I'm a, an environment editor, so that's no good. You know, know who your editor is and why you're pitching to them. Um, you need, you know, if it's news, it has to be newsy, it has to be timely, it has to be exclusive. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a pitch from someone. Uh, sounded like a great story. I was in a bit of a rush and I commissioned it. Uh, the following day at the news meeting, one of the other editors said, well, this was in all of the newspapers last week. So it's a story that was one we called that was covered by the Guardian Daily Mail. Uh, so this kind of, uh, you know, made me look a bit like an idiot. Uh, and this goes back to the point I made in one of my earlier slides is that editors need you to make them look good, right? So <laughs> your pitches and your stories should be great. And uh, if you do that, editors will like you too. So yeah, I don't really like this freelancer that much anymore. <laughs> uh, and now they're demanding to pay them a kill fee on that story, even though it wasn't new at all when they pitched it. Uh, another big problem is people pitching uh, uh, basically uh, general topics rather than story ideas. So people will say, I really want to write about GMOs or genetic uh, editing and how that's changing, you know, changing um, humanity or whatever, uh, or the way we do agriculture. Uh, and the problem with that is you don't have a specific story. You don't have a new discovery. You don't have a character. There's, there, there's not a story there. And apparently some publications uh, already have an abbreviation for these. They call them TNS, um, topic, not a story. Uh, and a huge number of pitches uh, falls into this category. So don't fall for that trap. Uh, pitches should be you know, short, um, short and, um, and clear. You don't want to be writing too much. Sometimes I get pitches that are about eight or 900 words long. And it's for a news story that will be maybe three or 400 news words long. So there's no point of doing that. If you can't tell me what a story is, in less words than the actual story will be, then you know we're not going to be able to publish that. Um, so what makes for a bad pitch? Lots of things, uh, as I mentioned already, not saying what the story is, uh, pitching something that's already been published, that's a big no-no, unless you have a clear new angle on it, right? So if, you, if there's a developing story and you have a really good angle that no one else has covered, then that's interesting. But if it's just the same story that's appeared in other media, there's really no point in pitching it. Um, yeah, and typos, jargon, and mistakes in, in emails. You know, when you get an email pitch from someone and it's packed with jargon, it's obvious that this person's str struggling to explain the science, even to you as an editor, so they're not going to be able to explain it to a uh, general audience either. Uh, common pitfalls, again, I mentioned some of these already. But here they are. One of the big ones is just forwarding a press release or just forwarding a paper. So often I'll get an email saying, um, you might be interested in this. And then there's like 2,000 word long press release attached or in the email forward. And the thing is most editors are really busy and we don't really have time to read all of this. That's why we need pitches that are clear and concise. So to tell us you know, why we need to publish this story rather than something else. So most of these emails like this just get you know, ignored, especially if you have to click on a link or open a, an attachment. It's extra work. It's going to take time. It's, it's not really worth doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, make sure you, you've done a little bit of research into your, into your pitch before. So don't say, you know, here, here's a pitch, but I have no idea why this is important and why it matters. And we had an example of this a new scientist recently. Uh, a person filed a story, an editor asked them, you know, a little bit more about it, exactly how does this happen? And this person says, to be honest, I'm not an expert on this, so I have no idea. <laughs> and that's not the way to do it, right? If you're writing about something or producing a program about something, in that moment, you are and should be the expert in it. And if you don't know the answer, you have to go to sources and find out what the answer is. Uh, yes, and then just be, you know, be flexible and quick in replying to editor's questions. If you're pitching news, uh, there's no point in kind of like not replying for two days to an editor because you know by that time this might not be news anymore it might be old news so what do best pitchers who we continue to work with do uh, these are, this is a list of just some of the things from the top of my head uh, but basically you know they're confident they know what a story is they've done a little bit of research uh, and they can convince you as an editor this is a story and here's why um, they know what the outlet is so they're pitching specifically to new scientists or to the BBC or to SciDevNet or to whatever the publication is. Uh, they will work with editor, be helpful, and uh, reply quickly. Uh, trust is a big one. Um, and this is, I guess, an issue if you're just starting out as a science writer or if you're pitching for the first time. Um, 
But this is why pitching is really important uh, because you have to establish the trust, I think, and a good pitch is a uh, first step towards establishing a trust. Because I think most editors prefer to work with people they worked with before and they can trust to you know, deliver a story on word count and in good time, right? So that's, that's a big thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, don't keep repeating errors. Uh, I have one person who pitches good ideas, but basically he keeps uh, doing the same thing. And he'll say, you know, here's a paper, you know, do you want this? Uh, and I keep telling him, you know, put a proper pitch together. And he never does. And basically this annoys editors. Eventually they'll just cut you out and they won't take your stories anymore. So uh, if you want to work for editors uh, and media outlets uh, repeatedly, you should, you should kind of take advice on board. Uh, and finally, read the pitching guidelines for the media outlets. So I would say that most outlets, most media outlets, will have a section on their website somewhere that will tell you how to write for them. And these are the two that I worked for, uh, SideMNet, Information for Freelancers. It tells you everything that you need to know and more. <laughs> Uh, you know, what makes a side net story uh, specifically? How do you pitch an idea for a news story? How do you construct a news story? How do you submit your finished news story? You know, everything is in here. Same with New Scientist. We have a guide for freelancers. It tells you exactly what you do, who to pitch, how to pitch. Uh, and there's no point of emailing me and saying, oh, I was just, you know, I met you at a summer school. I was wondering where the New Scientist takes freelance pitches. Because this tells me that you haven't been paying attention, tells me that you are not good at doing research because you haven't checked our website, and tells me that you're potentially lazy because, again, like you haven't done this, uh, done this uh, work, which is really easy. Just put in Google, New Scientist, Freelancers, or Pitching. Um, just a couple of examples what these guidelines look like. Again, they tell you exactly how to, how to craft a pitch. And uh, again, if your pitch doesn't follow these guidelines, editors are going to be annoyed and they're probably going to ignore your email rather than get back to you. So if you can take this on board, it will help you uh, publish your story in the media outlet that you want to publish it in. Uh, there's much more help available online. So the Open Notebook, as I said, has an amazing um, resource. It says it has pitching errors, how not to pitch, which is really useful to read. And it has pitch database of some like more than 140 actual pitches for science stories that tells you exactly which ones got accepted and why. And it's got um, quite a bit of information there from editors from different publications as well about what you know their advice is. Um, and side of net as well, as I mentioned before, hard to pitch to a science editor. It's a great, great online um, piece of content for you. Uh, finally, uh, before I move on to our panel, to our esteemed panel, <laughs> uh, there's going to be uh, an opportunity to learn much more about how do you pitch and to ask editors and senior reporters uh, questions about this and also to pitch them actual story ideas that you might have. Uh, so we'll start around 5.30, 5.45, and we'll go on until 9 o'clock this evening. It's a networking event uh, sponsored by Eureka Alert. And we've got Brian Lynn here from Eureka Alert, who will talk uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, but basically, this is a list of all the editors and senior reporters who've agreed to be there this evening. Um, and you'll be able to sign up for 10-minute uh, slots with each of them. So, you know, you can pick your top two or three, or you can pick all of them if you want. If they have time, if they're there, um, you'll be able to talk to all of them and ask them anything you want, from career advice to how to pitch to their uh, outlet. And I think the sign-up sheets will be... On the table, there are 10 tables as you go out, and there'll be a sign-up sheet on each table for the table for you and for each person. Yeah. So you have to have a person who can sit in when you go back. Yeah. So you just need to make sure you do that if you want to stay for, for this. Obviously, some people will hang around uh, anyway, and uh, you'll be able, you, you know, you're welcome to talk to them and network during coffee breaks. And there will be drinks at 5.30 as well. So you don't, don't feel pressure that you have to be at the networking session. But it's a great opportunity for you to have one-on-one -on -one for 10 minutes and have their attention, which is probably more than you will ever get in the real world, right? Because <laughs> as I said, these are all really busy people. So having said all of this, I'm going to uh, pass it on to our panel. Uh, they will each talk a little bit about you know, what they do and how you can pitch to their publications, uh, and maybe a little bit about their experience with pitching and what makes a good pitch and what doesn't make a good pitch. Um, and I guess we'll just start from here and go down the uh, panel. And the first person, Helen Thompson, uh, I worked with her at New Scientist. She was a biomed editor there at the time. And she's the person, she said not to say this, but I, I really have to. She's the person behind the uh, head transplant story. 
you know, the first human had transplant. That was an amazing, amazing story, and she's the editor, I think, who commissioned that. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll let Helen talk a bit about uh, her experiences and her advice for you. Great, uh, thanks. So, yeah, as Mitra said, I worked at New Scientist uh, as an editor for about eight years. Um, I was mainly in the news section, um, and then I went freelance a couple of years ago uh, to write a book. So now I'm a consultant at New Scientist, which basically means that um, they can uh, send me pictures if they're not sure about whether to commission them, and I just sort of have a, a glance over them and give my opinion. And also I come in and cover for the news editors when they go on holiday. Uh, so I'm, I guess I, I see it from both sides now as a freelancer and, and, and still working for New Scientist. Um, I think we'll probably have quite a few overlapping things to say here. So I'm just going to uh, give five points, really, uh, which are the five points that um, the news team at New Scientist, uh, most people have been taught to use um, uh, when, they're t when they're considering whether to uh, accept a pitch or not. So... Um, these five points um, are things that I've used for over a decade and I still now use as a freelancer, so I think they're quite generalisable to any um, news outlet. Um, the first is that we want it to be new, which obviously might sound quite obvious to you, but um, like Mitra said, the amount of times that we get stories that aren't new, um, and often with new scientists we have such a massive archive that um, you will find things that we've already written about because they've been mentioned at conferences maybe a year before. So while it might be new because it's out in a brand new journal this week, we might have already caught it at a conference a year ago. So please do uh, check, an check the outlet's archive um, uh, before you pitch a story. Uh, we want it to, the second thing is we want it to have moved the science on. Um, so a lot of science, as you know, happens in small increments and these, we, we need to pick and choose which of those increments we talk about. Um, we, ca we can't talk about them all, so we want you to think about why do I need to tell the um, audience this right now. Uh, we want it to be, third point is that we want it to be relevant. Um, so think about who your audience is. Um, if you are writing for an international magazine, uh, like New Scientist, you want the people who are reading it in the US, um, in Australia, online perhaps, to to think, okay, this is interesting to me, as well as the person in, in London and the small town in uh, Nova Scotia, you know. So we, you have to think about who your audience is and why they need to know what you're pitching. Um, and I think the two most important points are that we want it to make you go, wow. And we like to s surprise readers. Um, and it, you know, if you're telling them you need to know this, so if it doesn't make you go well, then why would it make anybody else that you're trying to pitch it to say the same? So, and then the last uh, fifth point is, and it's it's probably my favourite, is we want you to tell your friends down the pub. So, if whenever you see a story, whenever you think, is this something I should pitch to somebody? Think about whether you would go home and tell your husband or your wife or your friends down the pub about that story. And if you won't, then it's probably not a story for us. It's because probably nobody else is going to want to know about it either. So um, I have to say these five points um, have were, I think they were developed by somebody about 10 years ago. And there's one particular ex-now news editor who used to use it. I think she developed them. And she actually used to mark people's pictures out of five per point for, of each of these five points. And if it got over, I think it was 19 points, she would commission it. So uh, I think, and these, these kind of five points have been passed down through the years to other people. So um, that's specifically for new scientist news, but I've used them as a freelancer um, to order a pitch, you know, to I've put those five points in my pitches. And I say I've never had a pitch refused or had refused a pitch as, a, as an editor that has had all those five points in it. So I would say that they are quite a, um, a good measure of, of how to write a pitch, um, just to make sure you've got all those in there. Thank you, Helen. That's perfect. Um, next person, I guess, Inga. Yeah, you want to sure. say a little bit about who you are, where you work, and then... So, uh, so my name is Inga. I am at the moment the senior editor at Research. I was formerly a global news and features editor at SciDev.net, and I'm also a freelancer, so I kind of sit on both sides of the table. Half of the week I'm sort of lording over this big newsroom with lots of journalists and freelancers, and the other half of the week I'm alone in my little attic room, desperately clicking the refresh button in the hope that editors will respond to my pitches. So um, uh, 
research is uh, quite a special shop because we write about science policy. And so what I want to talk to you about is um, how do you tailor your pitches to a specific news outlet because we do not write about science per se and it's amazing how many journalists really struggle to understand what we do. We write about funding, we write about collaborations, we write about things like the REF and its successor, um, like you know things like Brexit for example, its impact on scientists, anything to do with EU policy around science. Um, but really it's what happens around and before the actual science takes place rather than the science itself. So how can you make sure that your pitch is interesting to a specific <coughs> news outlet? The first thing is to find out who the editor is you should send your pitch to. And the way to do that is looking at the website, of course, if you're not quite sure, give the organization a ring. And it's amazing how few journalists these days tend to do that. Or every news organization has a switchboard. You say, I am looking for, uh, I have this story about, I don't know, pregnancy-related illnesses. Who would be the right editor to pitch that to? And they might put you right through. They might just tell you. Um, if they put you right through, you could quickly talk to them on the phone about it. Um, they will say, send it to me in an email. That's always the final line. But at least you've spoken to them already and you know exactly who to send it to rather than sending it to some sort of anonymous news inbox that might get looked at today or maybe not. Um, so that's the first thing. I can say the second thing is to look at your story really carefully and think which news outlet would be the best one for it. So don't just kind of immediately go to the high profile ones like Nature and Science and then get a rejection. Um, if, if it's something very specific or quite niche, there might be a better suited publication out there. So do a little bit of rooting around. Take note of interesting publications that you come across. I actually have a list of sort of maybe 20 or even 30 publications that I think I might want to pitch to those in the future when I have something that would interest those. Um, and that way, you know, with smaller publications, <coughs> research is relatively small. Um, you actually have a much bigger chance of getting your pitch accepted because um, we don't get as many pitches as, for example, Cyderp.net got because we are so niche. So when people pitch to us, they get more attention from the editor than I could have given to pitches when I was um, at Cyderp.net, for example. Um, so kind of see if you can broaden out your field and find news outlets that might be slightly off the beaten track but actually really interested in your pitches and really happy to receive them. Um, and then, of course, the next thing is to think about the people who read those magazines or news websites or even, you know, watch those TV channels because one part that is really, well, one thing that makes a pitch stand out is if the journalist has thought about the readership and has tailored it so that the readership of that particular outlet or the consumer of the news story um, will actually be interested. And if I see that a reporter has done that and has understood who we write for and who our audience uh, um, is, that really um, is a sort of sparkling <laughs> star, you know. Um, so <laughs> it's worth kind of, yeah, obviously you should read the publications that you write for and read them with a sort of an ear out for who the readers are. Often read the comments as well. That's really interesting. It gives you a better sense of who um, your ultimate readers will be. Um, so that way, I think um, you can you can develop pitches that um, are much more tailored to a specific editor, maybe even and a specific news outlet, rather than some sort of general thing. Um, because the general pitches are usually the weaker pitches. The more you can sort of fine tune it towards a specific organization or even editor, um, the better. And then if that person's rejected, don't take the same pitch and just forward it on to the next person on the list. Kind of look, at, look at that email. You probably don't need to do very much, but look at it. Think, okay, so now I'm going to pitch to a different person. What do they want? Who's their audience? What's their angle? And just amend it a little bit before you send it on. Um, because I always feel it's, you know, I feel slightly disappointed when I see that, okay, I've probably been the fifth person down the list to get this pitch and this, this reporter hasn't even bothered to change the first line and they've just sort of put in my name. Maybe it still says, maybe it still says Mr., you know. <laughs> and that's just not a good start. So the more you can fine tune it, the better. That's my advice. Yeah, that's great. Can I just check, can everyone hear the panelists all the way in the back, yeah? It's fine? 
Okay, so next person, Ashling. Ashling uh, was my boss at one point at Cydemnet, and I always remember a piece of advice from her. I, I did a story about engineering for development, which was basically a blog post from a conference saying there's this great new program that's going to help change the world. And uh, Ashling said to me, yeah, it's a good story, but now go out and tell the real story why it's not going to work. Um, and I think you know it's it's an important thing to keep in mind. I mean, as journalists, we can often get up, uh, get caught up in the hype, and just kind of basically pitch the press release, pitch the new discovery straight, whereas the real story could be much deeper, and there might be might be much more nuanced. So it's just something that I've learned from Ashling, and hopefully you all can learn from her talk now. Uh, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just picking up on something you said about. Um, pitching to the right person. I was just looking through the Cydevnet news inbox yesterday. It goes back to 2012. It's got about 10,000 email emails in it, and uh, a lot of them unanswered pitches. So the ones that got answered actually went to the news editor by name, I think. So that's a lesson. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm editor of Cydevnet, and you might notice there are two people with that title at the conference today, because I finish on Friday and my replacement started on Monday, so this week there are two of us. Uh, the other one you'll meet, you'll meet this evening. Um, I, too, have been on both sides of the fence. I've spent a lot of my life as a freelance, um, but I've also worked as science correspondent for a number of years on the Daily Telegraph and on the Times Higher Education Supplement. and. Um, also as news editor on CyDevNet for a number of years. Um, it's been mentioned a lot, but you may not know the publication very well. It aims to cover science and technology that's of use or interest to the developing world. Um, and it was set up about 15 years ago to get that information and criticism out um, to countries that may not have access to it. And it had a second goal, equally as important, to find, develop, and mentor science journalists in the developing world, which it's had some success in doing. Um, you have to keep turning over stones, because the successful ones then go on and work for other people, and then we're, we're starting at the beginning again. Um, and we have a hub in the UK and five regional bases where, um, across the world um, where they're actively um, commissioning many stories every week from all sorts of people. Um, the opportunities working for CyDevNet would be twofold, really. There's, there's pitching to the global office. Um, and um, in that case, you need to be switching your mind, as the others have said, to who, is, who would want to read this story. We are looking for discoveries of global significance, really. Um, and you have to then turn your mindset to, to the developing world. It's not just what's of interest to us. Um, and then also, if any of you are thinking of donning a backpack and going off um, trying to try your luck in other countries, um, our regional editors would be very interested in pitches from Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia Pacific in particular, uh, even though most of our journalists have come from those countries. A, a good pitch is always um, too much to resist, uh, and we'll probably take it. Um, I think, obviously, I agree with everything that the others have said, so I would, thought I would highlight a couple of other things about pitching. Um, and one of them comes from an observation I made when I was on The Telegraph in the, in the late 90s. The health editor announced that they were getting so many pitches that they were non, no longer even going to listen to or read pitches from people who were not already freelancing for them. And I thought, how depressing if you're a, a freelance journalist trying to break into a new market. Um, it, it's, you know, some subjects are very, very popular and it's very hard to break in. And I think one of the ways around that is to come to events like this, because um, th that was a way of dealing with inundation, but it was also a trust issue that Mitya mentioned. And if you've met somebody, even if you can put a face to the name, I think you've already escalated a few steps up the trust ladder. So I think if there's any way of meeting commissioning editors, um, I, I think that really helps when you pitch and they, they recognize the name. Um, 
talking about researching the outlet, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, it's also worth trying to pick up what's happening in that outlet at the moment. Um, for example, the SciDefNet uh, in the past has had a lot of funding from donors who had their priorities. And when I was news editor there, we were desperate for stories that had an element in them that were to do with women scientists. Anything about gender that could possibly pass as a news story, we were grabbing at because, uh, you know, a lot of the stories just can't qualify as news. But if you could find something, we wanted it. How do you know that? Well, you probably know that through chatting and networking and, you know, keeping your eye open. The other thing you might pick up at the moment before you come and pitch to me is that SciDevNet nearly went bust last year and has got hardly any money <laughs> at the moment. It's a temporary situation, and I think in January uh, we'll start living and breathing properly again. Um, but it needs to be a really good pitch um, to get commissioned right at the moment. Um, and the other thing I would look out for is not just, um, you know, when you're looking through a story, what other media are they putting into that story? Because we love stories that are easily um, depicted visually. If there's an infographic, a graphic, uh, little multimedia piece that can go in it, we will pay extra attention to that pitch because we know that we get far more hits if we've tweeted a story that's got a, um, something like that to click on. Um, so I've covered, I, I suppose, the trust and knowing your commissioning editor. I've, I've gone into a little bit more depth about researching your actual publication. I would say one more thing, which is about omniscience. Over the years, I've had so many pitches from journalists who think I know my subject. And they think I know everything that's happening. And I don't. And I think most of us don't. <laughs> um, and that, if, if you do make that assumption, then you're going to be lazy in your pitch. You, know, you need to, without patronizing the editor, of course, uh, you need to um, let them know that it's new and why it's new, you know, prove it's new if you can, and um, the context, why it's significant and why sh you should write it. Don't assume that the editor will know that. Thank you. Actually, actually very useful. So the next person is Josh. Uh, I worked with Josh on a news desk, and now he's a features editor at uh, New Scientist, and he's going to talk a bit more about, you know, how do you actually pitch a feature, which is quite different to news. Uh, and, you know, even our work workflows and work lives have changed a lot now that I'm on news and he's on features. So I might do, like, two stories every day, commission and edit and publish, whereas he'll focus on one really in-depth story, you know, every two weeks. So it's... Uh, quite different workflow, and I think the process of pitching will be different as well. And part of the problem that I have on the news desk is that I get young people and early career journalists pitching me features, and they immediately want to write long form, you know, uh, 10,000 words or something. Uh, and that doesn't really work for news. Uh, and usually, you know, I, I would advise advise that, you know, you probably need to have a little bit more expertise in, the, in an area before you pitch features, but Josh will be able to tell you more on that. And maybe he can just answer one question for us. Uh, I often get asked about Josh, and the main question is, how do you pronounce his surname? Um, so, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, good morning. So to answer the first question, it's pronounced how'd you go? Um, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got teased about that as a child. But no, look at me. <laughs> no. <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, so I work at New Scientist, which is a real privilege, and I also work on features, which is also a real privilege. Um, I hope that you guys do love the idea of writing, you know, long, long features, long, long form, as some people call it. Um, I, I just the first thing I wanted to, to very quickly say is that I remember coming to an event like this a few years ago and hearing an editor, a, a feature editor at New Scientist, talk about you know what they did, and just thinking, oh man, I could never ever never ever do that, I can never pitch to them. I just wanted to really quickly say, you definitely should email me or the six or seven other feature editors at New Scientist, like, we're just people, I definitely want to hear from you, like, I personally, like, there are, like, annoying things in pitches, but in general, I would say, don't be afraid, just, like, reach out, um, so, just a word of encouragement. So, um, 
I thought I'd just say a little bit about what the difference is between news and features. It's probably really, this is probably going to be really obvious to you. So um, maybe maybe not all of it. So there's kind of two points I wanted to make. So one is that, particularly at New Scientist, we're looking for something. We we are we are producing a product. It's got to sell. We we we're not you know SciDev is funded by donors and so on. We are actually trying. That's not a smear or anything, I don't mean it like that. But we're actually <laughs> trying to sell something. So it means that what your story has got to be something that people are going to love to read. So th think in those terms if you're going to pitch a feature to new scientists and probably other places. Don't, don't necessarily start from science or the next, the, just the discovery that you've seen this week. Try to maybe reverse engineer it a little bit and think about what's the story that you'd love to read right now. Um, so a cell, some, something that's, and all of what Helen said applies to that. You know, is it something that's going to make you going to, you know, something that you're going to want to talk to your friends down the pub about? Um, so that's number one, a cell. Um, the second thing is a bit more specific to features, which is that we really want a story. And what I mean by that is, you know, news um, news articles often have that triangle structure, don't they? Where you have, you know, basically the news goes right at the top, and then um, by about sort of three quarters of the way through, probably you're not saying so such interesting things anymore. With with a feature, we really want people to sit down with a coffee and spend a good 15 minutes or so really enjoying this piece of beautiful crafted journalism like you would with a book or something. Um, and so what you need to do in your pitch is persuade me, uh, or other editors obviously, that you have the ingredients uh, to construct that that story, that narrative. Um, as I say, this is probably pretty obvious, but so things like, do you have a, a protagonist, or if not a protagonist, do you have like a big project that's trying to achieve something? Um, do you have, uh, do you have some obstacles that they're going to have to overcome? Do you have some sort of resolution? Do you have some? Um, sometimes we refer to them as like progressive complications in the story. So you know. Um, if you think about something like a film like Star Wars, for instance, you know something that people love to watch. Maybe not. Maybe not all of you. I don't know. Um, you know, Luke sets out to defeat the Force, and then there are setbacks, and then the Sith Lord like has a double sword, double lightsaber. You know, oh, stuff like that has got to happen in your feature. Do you know what I mean? Like you've got. There's got to be twists and turns. Uh, we want people to be entertained. That's all. that you want to read and pitch that. And uh, I just have to say, it doesn't always work. I had a story that I really wanted to read, pitched it to Josh, and he said, it's never going to happen. It's science fiction. <laughs> um, so yeah, even even if when you work in the New Scientist, you often can't get your pitches in. Um, and I also want to say, before I worked at New Scientist, I pitched a few times, and I never had a story accepted. Um, so you know, don't get discouraged by that. Um, finally, on our panel, we have Laura from Politico. Uh, very exciting publication. Uh, I heard a talk uh, last week uh, at the European Conference of Science Journalists by someone from there, and it seems to be one of these, uh, you know, fairly fresh publications that's doing really well uh, with young readers and online and um, social media. Um, so that's kind of quite encouraging to see, uh, because actually uh, just chatting over coffee with some of these other people from New Scientist, side of Net, Research Research. And it sounds like lots of our publications are going through restructuring and, you know, uh, uncertain times. So it's nice to see that, you know, there are uh, other new, newer uh, publications cropping up as well where people can get jobs. <laughs> but yeah, over to Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I guess I think uh, hopefully my message today is one of optimism for people that are maybe looking for new opportunities or the the potential to write about more than just science. Um, I started, I studied science, I did, you know, the science communication course, you know, pretty typical background, and now I find myself working in Brussels, editing stuff about Macron's position on trade, or the head of the commission's faux pas in the parliament yesterday. Um, so there are, there are opportunities out there, and, but the reason I'm here today is that another um, perhaps surprising message is how valuable scientific understanding and knowledge is to publications like mine. We cover, we cover big European politics, but we also cover policy areas in great detail. And I've 
I'm amazed at the number of stories that have a scientific basis. You know, we cover tech policy, healthcare policy, energy environment, um, agricultural policy, and you know, when I was hired, um, my colleagues were like, wow, this is amazing, you understand science. Whereas I come from a background where everyone understands science, you know, that was kind of normal. So, um, so that's cool. We also just hired James Randerson, who was environment um, editor at The Guardian and news, news editor for years. So I think um, that's kind of an exciting message, hopefully. Um, so yeah, a bit more about Politico. We are two years old in Brussels now. Um, it started as an American outlet, and so there's a massive team in the States, and they set up a side project with Axel Springer in Brussels, um, and it's expanded rapidly. We've got about 50 editorial staff in Brussels um, and a small office in London as well. Um, we're kind of taking <coughs> on correspondence in Berlin and Paris and all, all across the continent. Um, and yeah, so what, what do we want? I mean, the thing that most stands out for me is the speed of um, stuff at Politico. So I used to work uh, with Inga at Research, research and um, the kind of, the speed at Politico is a different, different beast. Um, something that's a few hours old is old. Um, so if you're trying to pitch news, then flagging before is going to happen. So say, you know, we've got this thing coming up tomorrow or next week. Um, this is why you should care, and this is how I can have you a story within a couple of hours of whatever that thing happening is. Um, in terms of, um, you know, we take longer articles, and there, a lot of the stuff that Josh said really rang true, actually. For us, it's about, is it a great story? You know, is this something that people who aren't scientists are going to want to read, you know. Um, and I just pulled a few of um, ideas from our archive that um, we published recently. So there was one about um, HIV therapy in Crimea. So when Russia annexed Crimea, they basically shut down this um, therapy program. Um, <coughs> that was a great, great piece, did really well. Um, we ran a big feature on Gates and his funding for um, the WHO and um, his influence there. Um, we do a lot of stuff on um, chemicals, uh, formaldehyde, glyphosate, all these kind of sinister um, things that are being regulated by the EU. Um, we've done quite a lot on bees. Obviously, neonicotinoids has been a big um, issue for in science for the last, uh, and will continue to do so, to be so. Um, that's really interesting for us. So. Um, those are the kind of stories we cover, um, and I think the other things to mention would be, you know, does it have the opportunity for great graphics? Is it a database story? You know, we've got an amazing website, and we run a weekly newspaper, um, and our images and stuff are really great, so that's kind of cool, um, and an opportunity for you guys. Um, and then in terms of the actual pitching, I think, I'd echo everything that's been said on the panel already. And you know, can you write a story budget, three sentences explaining why, you know, what the great story is and why anyone should care? 